Well, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tim. You didn't remark that you let me in when I had multicolored hair when you first met me. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's I could have a lot of stories, but I didn't want to. Okay. Okay. Is anybody familiar with this room and it, that you can do it with turning the lights down a little bit, but not all the way off? What? All right, well, so somebody figure it out for me. All right. Uh, thanks, Daryl, uh, for that introduction. Uh, thanks for holding off on various stories. So I know you all can read, but true to tradition, I will read the title out loud to you guys. Uh, the title of my talk is On the Accessibility and Manipulation of Brain Signals for Neuroprosthetic Applications. Now some of you in the audience may not know what a neuroprosthetic actually is, so I'll begin with a brief, brief primer on neuroprosthetics before I actually delve into the meat of my experiments. The goal of neuroprosthetics is very simple. Spinal cords do not regrow when injured but your brain is still alive. So if you are unfortunately suffer from a tra traumatic spinal cord injury, you can still will a motor cortex command signal in your brain, but that command signal simply cannot travel down to your musculature. So it's often been an idea in the neuroscience and engineering field that if you could somehow tap into the motor cortex command signals, perhaps you could actually use those signals to drive a device. And so let's talk about briefly the history. Now, the first person to actually show that you could use uh, motor cortex signals to drive uh, a controller was actually done here at the University of Michigan by James Olds. But not many people know about that because it was published in a very obscure conference proceedings in Japan. The real first go-to reference that everybody knows is in 1969 by Eberhard Fetz, where he implanted monkeys in the motor cortex and isolated single units and then trained the monkey to modulate its motor cortex unit activity in order to be rewarded. So let's go to the actual data. They isolated a single unit, and then they um, recorded the baseline activity, and you can see it's at, it's at about five hertz. Then they set up a contingency, such that if an increase in neural discharge was rewarded with a food pellet, and the monkey was given feedback of his neural discharge in a simple form of just pips that anyone who's done electrophysiology is familiar with, just a bunch of spiking activity that you will hear in some movies later. Once they set up the contingency, you can see that the motor unit rapidly increases uh, within minutes to uh, 10 hertz, they then remove the contingency, a la extinction, it drops down again, it they restore the contingency, it increases, they remove it, it drops down. So this was a science paper, it was very influential, it got a lot of people thinking about perhaps you could use these output signals of the motor cortex to perhaps drive a neuroprosthetic device, and even Eberhard Hart Fett speculated on this at the end of this brief paper. But there was a problem. Technology really hadn't gotten to the point yet where this could become a reality. In this paper, they were just using single unit, multi, single unit recordings, and it took work done here and at other places with increases in multi-electrode arrays, increases in computer power, increases in signal pro improvements in signal processing algorithms for ensemble decoding. All three of those had to kind of come together, and it really took until the late 90s for this field to be reinvigorated again. And it was reinvigorated by a paper, paper some of you may be familiar with, by Chapin and Nicolaelis' group, uh, whereby they used a multi-electrode array, were able to record about 25 units, and they trained a, a rat to hit a lever in order to drive a water arm that would sweep towards the rat and he could, he could uh, sip the water, he was water deprived. And so once they had actually recorded the rat doing this, they were able to decode the trajectory of the forepaw hitting the lever, and then they changed the rules such that the lever wasn't actually driving the water arm, but his motor activity of pressing the lever was driving the lever arm. And here's just a schematic of it. You see a little mean looking rat, he's hitting the lever, it sweeps the water arm, they record about 25 units, and they use that to decode the trajectory of the arm. And in some very compelling results, in about three or four of the animals out of six, they noticed that the animal effectively stopped moving, and it would just approach the lever arm, not move its forepaws, and then the motor ensemble activity would drive the lever arm. So this was basically this, the, uh, the paper that launched the thousand ships. Uh, it got a lot of notice in the science community. The DARPA and the NIH started funding multiple labs to investigate the multiple engineering issues associated with this technology. And, be, and it funded labs, including Daryl's, to investigate this. Also in the background, uh, in 1998, 
Philip Kennedy, a uh, neurosurgeon in Atlanta, implanted electrodes in the motor cortex of locked-in patients. Locked-in patients are people who are paralyzed but are fully conscious. Like, if any of you have seen the butterfly in the diving bell or something, yeah, I think that's it. Um, he, they're, in, they're unable to interact with their external world. So he put electrodes in the motor cortex uh, with his patented two-wire electrode and was able to train a human, basically the same as Eberhard Spetz's monkey work, to modulate the activity. So that's important. That means maybe you could actually do this in a human. So, in 2002 of March, I was taking neuroanatomy and I was taking neuroscience 602 with Wayne Aldridge sitting up here. And it was actually rather cool. We were studying motor physiology. And over the course of those three months, three land, landslide papers came out um, where a Donahue's group at Brown University implanted the motor cortex of monkeys and was able to drive 2D cursor control. Eric, my good friend, remembers me coming home and talking about this paper that had just come out last week. And so you can look at me a young buck at 22 with my mullet and greasy hair and uh, bad facial hair uh, dissecting a human brain and neuroanatomy just across the hall and I was deciding what to do for my dissertation and these three papers came out and I, I, I love neuroscience but part of me is also a wannabe engineer at heart and so this concept of, a, of combining engineering and neuroscience got me very excited and I uh, walked into a uh, seminar that Daryl gave and uh, approached him about joining his lab and so um, there's, I'm not going to give you the history lesson on neuroprosthetics. Basically, every year, one or two papers comes out that improves the speed, degrees of freedom, accuracy. But I'll just tell you what the state of the art is before I move in. So Donahue now, four years later, implanted humans uh, with, with a 100 electrode array and was able to, the person was able to use that, uh, his motor ensemble activity to actually drive a mouse cursor. And you can see it's a little bit noisy, it's a little bit jagged, but it appears the human is actually using it. That's, that's pretty exciting. And then also, Phil Kennedy, yet again, 10 years ahead of everybody else, uh, is now implanting Broca's area. Can okay, anybody tell me what Broca's area is? I'm full of neuroscientists, come on now. It's this part of the human brain responsible for, for speech production. So someone who is locked in or who is paralyzed can still think about talking, but the command signal cannot get to his mouth and his tongue. And so they implant it, he, he's implanting Broca's area and telling the person to actually will speaking. And they are actually starting to be, decode phonemes and vowels. So that's pretty exciting. It hasn't been published yet, but I'm really excited to see what happens in 10 years with this technology. And then finally, for no one who's ever seen this, Work by Andy Schwartz at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Andy Schwartz was a pioneer in ensemble decoding in the 80s, and uh, he's, he is real-time recording the ensemble activity of the motor cortex, calibrating it to motor arm trajectory, and then actually using those calibrations to drive a robotic arm in real time, and the monkey is using this robotic arm to feed itself. So this is a very exciting new technology, but with any new technology, there are a variety of engineering issues that need to be addressed to explore the, tr the um, parameter space of this. So I'm going to talk about three experiments here, three themes. The first one is on the suitability of the cingulate cortex for neural control. So traditionally, people have targeted the motor cortex as the output signal for a neuroprosthetic device. But it always kind of struck me as rather odd because the, the patient population of people who might actually need a neuroprosthetic device locked in may have ALS, arterial lateral sclerosis, or PLS, primary lateral sclerosis. And can anybody tell me what those diseases do? I don't hear very well, excuse me. It destroys the upper motor neurons. So if you're trying to use the very out, if you're going to use upper motor neurons as your output signal, perhaps it's not ideal in someone with ALS or PLS. So I was interested in investigating alternative prefrontal areas. So in a rat model, you can debate whether a rat even has a prefrontal cortex, but in my literature survey, I found four areas. The orbital frontal cortex, the, pre, the medial prefrontal cortex, the frontal association area, and the cingulate cortex. The orbital frontal cortex is typically, is, mostly responsible for odor discrimination in the rat and also hippocampal tasks. The, prefront, the medial prefrontal cortex is used for learning and memory, most notably extinction. The frontal association area is debated whether it even exists or what it even does. So I converged on a cingulate cortex as the compelling alternative site.